cool. All right. Uh, let me get this up. All right. Can you all see the my slides? Uh, I don't know. Oh, oh, I didn't click share yet. Okay, there we go. Slides now. There it is. Yeah. All right. Awesome. All right. So, I guess we'll get started. Um, so yeah. So this week, as you all know, was uh, chapter seven on environments. And um, as we were just saying, I think the first thing I wanted to mention is that there was a lot going on in this chapter. Uh, I like put all these diagrams here because uh, in this one phrase, this one uh, line here, because um, I just found it kind of, I had to read it multiple times and um, these diagrams got a little bit confusing, at least for me. Um, and so uh, I hope that the presentation will kind of like go through kind of a lot of the main ideas and concepts and then we can have some time to talk through some of the pieces that may be a little bit more a little bit unclear um you know and maybe talk through some of these more complex diagrams but the first time reading it i was uh <laughs> my head was exploding a little bit uh it's kind of confused but um yeah i think um but yeah, I think, you know, reading it a couple times uh, made it a little bit better, but, um, but yeah, so here's my best shot. Um, so the chapter kind of starts out by uh, talking, bringing back some of the concepts from chapter six uh, from last week uh, about, I think I spelled scoping wrong, um, but uh, lexical scoping. Um, so um, basically, uh, you know, the, the, the way in which um, functions uh, kind of operate in their environment and the way you, you know, when you're calling certain objects, like within a function, uh, it searches and knows where to kind of find the different pieces it needs to execute. Um, and so these are the kind of four main principles. Um, and Hadley brings them up again at the beginning of the chapter um, to, uh, kind of make a connection between uh, the dis larger discussion on environments and the specific types of environments that make lexical scoping possible. Um, and so for instance, I just put these two examples down here um, uh, representing uh, the fresh start concept. And so, you know, when each time you run a function, it's being run in a new execution and function environment. And then that gets kind of cleaned up after it's done. Um, and that's a special instance of an environment, a special type of environment. And then um, as well as dynamic lookup. Uh, so kind of the, the um, it doesn't, the, um, the function doesn't get, uh, it gets executed at the moment that it, you need it. Uh, and, and whatever's in the media environment at the time, that's what it references. Um, and so, so yeah, so kind of reintroducing those concepts and making connection to the environments. Um, uh, that's kind of how this got started. And um, so kind of from a high level, uh, Hadley talks about our environment being, um, the job of this environment being to associate or bind a set of names to a set of values. Um, so you know, objects and uh, functions and um, as well as like the packages you have loaded. Um, and so, uh, and fundamentally it's, it's a data structure, which I, when I first read that, I actually was pretty surprised that you know, it's considered a data structure. I hadn't really dealt with environments before and um, at least in R that much like explicitly and how they're constructed. Um, and uh, and yeah, so, so I thought that was interesting and that it was similar to a named list. So there was a few differences though. So in, in, um, in environments, every name has to be unique. Um, the names in the environment are not ordered. So that has consequences for if you want to, um, pull values or um, bindings out of an environment or, or index them, you can't do it uh, through like a numerical indexing because they're not ordered. So like using numbers in, you know, indexing those objects, environmental objects doesn't make any sense because um, you can reference them by name and I'll talk about it a little bit later. Um, but uh, also environments uh, have like parents. So there's some kind of hierarchical structure to them, um, which is a little bit different, I guess, in some ways than a name list. Um, and then 
environments are also not copied when modified. So we know that from previous chapters that when lists and other objects are, um, uh, mod are modified, there's a new copy made in memory. Um, and that's not true with environments or else things would become, become kind of uh, unwieldy with the memory usage. Um, and then, uh, and so R in general, and like a lot of other programming languages, use environments to uh, kind of as a structure and the relationship between different environments that you're working with uh, to find objects and packages that you call. As I mentioned, they're uh, you know somewhat. I think it's, this is an appropriate way to describe it. A hierarchical, so there's parents and parent environments and child environments. And uh, as Abby mentioned a few minutes ago, environments can contain themselves. Um, and so um, below are a couple of examples. So one on the, on the left, the code is you know, an example of uh, constructing an environment. So it does you know, look a lot like a, a named list when you construct it. Um, and then on the right, just a diagram of an environment kind of in, a, in the gray box and then all the objects that are in that environment and the values that are bound to those objects. Um, and feel free to jump in or stop at any time as I go through this um, or add anything. Um, all right. So there's a Hadley goes over a few different types of environments, uh, major types. So we, you know, there's the current environment, um, the global environment, and then there's special types and environments. Uh, so package environment, function, namespace, and execution. I'll go into those a little more um, later. Um, but oftentimes you're working in R, the current environment is the same as a global environment, like you're working in the global environment, but that's not always true. Um, okay, uh, so going to the point of like environments being hierarchical or having parents, um, almost, ev almost every environment has a parent, um, except for the, like, the, the empty environment. And so you see in, in this example that, um, that you have two environments, E2A and E2B, and um, uh, let's see, uh, let's get this backwards. And uh, E2B uh, uh, kind of contains E2A, so uh, let's see, so E2, E2A is a parent of E2B. Yes, that's right, I don't think so. Um, and so you see that kind of demonstrated with the, the arrow uh, being drawn to, uh, E2A. Um, okay. All right, and then um, and then just showing again. So if you call uh, uh, environment parents, um, so you could either kind of keep calling uh, for an environment's parent kind of recursively over and over again, and um, you it'll keep giving you an answer until you get to the empty environment result, which is at the bottom of this list here, or you can call this environment parents uh, function. Um, I believe it's from Arlang, uh, I think, and um, and it'll show you kind of that whole structure. And so, um, and in this case, you have to specify the option as an empty environment is the last one or else it won't, it'll stop, I think, at the global environment. Um, and I thought this was similar to <laughs> uh, like Russian dolls uh, because they're, you know, like, one is contained inside the other. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'll go into a little more well, in a few slides about the packages and like what, uh, how they appear in that order. Um, but does anyone have any questions so far? Or anything? Okay. okay. Um, and then uh, Hadley goes, starts to go into uh, how, you know, you can start to look for objects within environments. And so, this in my mind is kind of setting up, uh, setting you up for how R looks for objects, you know, when you're using it in, in different kind of contexts um, with an example of like how to do it manually. And so in this case, we have those two same, those two same environments we were just talking about. And he gives you a function where uh, you give it, you know, the name of, um, of an object and then it'll, kind of keep recursively calling that function. So you see on the bottom here, um, if if it can't find the, the object, it goes a level deeper and a little deeper and a little deeper and it keeps on going um, until uh, 
until the, the object is found, unless the, unless the empty environment is reached and um, then it, it can't find it. Um, then I'll say it can't find it. Um, but just kind of as a setup for, for how R looks through different environments and structures. Um, okay, and then when you, and then uh, we talk a little bit about interacting with environments and so getting and setting uh, values. And so there's a few different ways to do this. Um, so in the first chunk here, uh, like Hadley is creating an environment and then um, a lot like, you know, data frames and uh, I think lists work like this. Um, if you kind of use a dollar sign and, and um, uh, reference uh, like an object that doesn't exist or a dimension that doesn't exist and you assign something to it, it'll create that dimension. Um, uh, in this case, Z and assign the value of three. Um, and as you can see here, this is an example of how you would like index an environment. So by calling the actual, uh, like uh, using the name with the double brackets. Um, and then there's other ways of binding objects to environments. Um, so environment poke would, would be very similar to the above uh, example or above method, um, just with this convenience function um, where you assign the a, uh, you bind 100 to A in environment E3. And then if you want to do uh, multiple bindings, EV bind will let you do that um, with uh, any number of uh, objects. All right. And then, so I mentioned earlier, there's uh, a few different types of special environments um, uh, that, that are uses and that you kind of interact with um, some of uh, with in the case of uh, namespaces as I'll talk about in a second it's a little bit more hidden from the user um, but you you know use all these different environments on a regular basis um, and so the first one is the package environment so this is basically like when a user is is uh, loading packages and getting calling packages um, this is uh, kind of the environment that they're they're doing it from and uh, where for in the, in this case um, the order of the packages in the environment kind of what like what what's uh, kind of the child and what's the parent uh, it's determined by uh, when the package is loaded by the user and what's called first um, and so uh, in this case like base is the last is the kind of highest parent or yeah the highest parent and so uh, that would that would be the first thing that was called and then it would, uh, kind of go all the way back you know as you go back closer to the global environment it's the more recent uh call yeah i think that's right yeah um and you can use the search function so this is in this case this is just my uh, environment when i was doing these slides so i was using um uh Zeringen. so I cannot figure out how to pronounce that but get it get it one day um, I meant to include a picture here, but I forgot. Um, but it, we'll, we'll go over it when we get there. Um, we'll get back to the book. But uh, the second type, a special environment, is a is a function environment. And so I just thought this quote was helpful. Um, so a function binds the current environment when it's created. Um, this is called the function environment and is used for lexical scoping. Um, and across computer languages, functions that capture and close in their environments are called closures, which is why the term is so often used interchangeably with, with uh, function in our documentation. And I thought that was interesting. Uh, one, one small reason I thought it was interesting, this paragraph was because um, I think a common message that I never really understood was this um, error message was this uh, object of type closure is not susceptible. And like you see it on like Twitter, you know, people talking about it, and uh, and no one really. I feel like a lot of people don't really understand it. And uh, when I read this, I was like, okay, so if a, you know, if a if a function is a closure, then I think I understand it. Like you can't subset a function, so you it's not subsettable. But uh, anyway, I just that's the first thing I thought of when I read this, um, and I. I was kind of happy that that light bulb went off. I see some others nodding and stuff. Um, so it seems like maybe that happened for you all too. Um, let me just actually go to the function area because I wanted to, I forgot to put in that picture in a um, diagram. Uh, okay. 
Yeah, um, so I would say this was a little bit confusing to me. Um, this, uh, this, especially the second section. And so I think this first diagram made sense to me where, uh, you know, you have a certain environment where uh, the function is, is bound to F and then that function um, binds, kind of like creates this closure you know, with that includes the current global environment. Um, and it binds itself to that global environment. So I, I thought that made sense. Uh, but then they brought in this 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 uh, diagram here where you have uh, a global environment, a, a kind of a sub uh, child environment, I guess, is created in that global environment. And then within that global environment, you're binding a function that returns one to G. Um, yeah, and then I guess as they're saying that this this function that you've created now uh, within the, its closure is the global environment. Um, I don't know if that's the right way to explain it, um, but did anyone else have trouble with this section, like this idea here? I, I was just, uh, if anyone knows if I'm <laughs> explaining this correctly, this part correctly, uh, it's just, I, I tripped over it a couple times. Um, um. The, the way that, so like, I also looked at this diagram many, many times and, and I don't actually know if this is correct, but the way that I wrap my head around this was like remembering that the white boxes are like just names and like nothing else. Like, like, so when I was puzzling through this, I was like, the environment is like in this one, but then it's there. But what helped, what I think got me the closest to feeling like it made sense was being able to say like, okay, there's two environments, there's the global environment and this other environment. And like, there happens to be this little name E like hanging out in the global environment pointing to the real thing. But like, that's all it is. Like, that's just where the name is. You're going to have a name somewhere potentially, and then it's going to point to the environment. And then the function environment is like going to be, it's like, it's like a pronoun. I think it's like, it's going to be some other environment. Like, does it, that make sense? But then this, so I think that that is really helpful, but then, then this arrow that's coming back from the function, I guess this function and uh, environment to the global environment, is that showing this closure idea that it's like, that the, it's binding itself to the global environment because like that's the environment that it was created in or? I don't know. Wait, so, so someone should correct me if I'm wrong, but I thought that in this case, the global environment is the function environment. Oh. Is that correct? I don't know. <laughs> right, so, so, so my understanding of it was, so like we have this, we make an environment E, we create this function G that happens to be inside E. It's only like that because we'd said E dollar sign G, right? So we just put the name of G inside E. Mm -hmm. And then, but like the, the function environment of the function is the global environment, which is what mm -hmm. it's going back to. But that made sense for like half a second while you were saying it. I had a, I had a moment where that made sense to me. So thank you. <laughs> It might be gone now. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think what's helpful to me about that is thinking that, you know, there are these distinct environment types and special environments, but at a given moment in time, they could be equivalent to each other. Right? Like the function environment could be equal. Like if you were to do that identity function, would that would the function environment be equal to the global environment? If that's true. I'm, I'm actually, let me test this out right now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to run this code. Uh, I think I just don't understand what X is doing. Oh, yeah. What is, what's X about? Isn't X the argument? No. Does the argument, no argument. Does the but argument, no argument. Is there. Yeah. Is that, is that 
Are we sure that isn't a mistake? That like that, I feel like that's silly. But... <laughs> <laughs> I think it is a mistake. Because like everywhere else, that little name in the function is the name of an argument. Like right. Because like above here, uh, the you take this function takes x as the argument. Yeah. Right. But isn't there a thing where it... if you don't supply the argument, isn't this like the point of environments? If you don't supply that argument, it like goes up the environments looking for what it thinks is the because like I've seen this I okay I'm glad someone brought this up because like I've never seen that before where I'm I'm so like maybe like too basic with this but to have a function with no arguments and then the number one next to it I like truly almost don't understand what that's giving me as and I was just gonna like try to cruise through it but maybe maybe, mm -hmm. maybe it's is it supposed to be like that that's that's a thing right that's like a fancy Hadley. I think it just I think it just always, one. yeah, it just always returns one. Like Okay. You would do E dollar sign G parentheses, and you'd always get back a one. Oh, it's different from the function um, in the example ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Late night. But I, but I, I agree I with what you said. I think just wrong. Like, yeah. I would have expected F, so because Y is in that gray box, I would yeah. have also expected F to be in that box, right? Because we've made Y and an F so far. X is a default of F. So is he building on the example before? Like, is yeah. that why? That's where why is from. Oh. I think okay. so. Wait, uh, can I share my screen really quick? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, so here's the, uh, someone has to give me permission. Hey, you should yeah. have permission. To, everyone should have permission to share screens. But uh, one participant can share at a time. Here, multiple participants can share simultaneously. Okay. Use your powers for good. I will not do that. I'm just kidding. Um, oh no, that's the wrong one. I don't want to share this one. Oh no. So I have to open system preferences. There we go. You look so serious. Yeah, because <laughs> it's like sending me annoying things. Oh, hold on. Okay. I may actually, oh wait, no. There we go. Does this work? Yes, so you're sharing. Okay, cool. So this is what I was doing really quick was just like, create the exact thing he's doing and just say, okay, so this is the environment that's here. And then what is the function environment of that function? And it says it's the global environment. Mm. Does that okay. Yes. Yeah, so then that confirms what, yeah, it's, yeah. Okay. So, so that answers what's going on. That answers that question about this, the diagram, like, the thing that the arrow from the black dot is pointing to is the function environment. Like function environment is like a, it's like a pronoun for some other environment. Can like, you say what the function environment of G is? What? Dollar sign G. Which one? Just I don't think G is a function. No, it is. Never mind. Sorry. It's the name that's bound to the function. Dir. If you take E dollar sign off, does it still work or? I think it, it shouldn't, right? Because, yeah, because, right, because G, sorry. You guys can still see my screen, right, or now? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, because yeah, G doesn't you, exist, right? Yeah. G lives over here. Right. Inside E. Hmm. Why wasn't the function environment E? because we defined the function in the global environment. So when I, de when I define this function, I did this in the global environment. Mm. I put because the, the is it because of the order of, like the function is defined and then it's assigned to G mm -hmm. and in E, I don't know. I mean, it's weird to me too that like you can't, reference the object g from your global environment like is that because it's like one step lower than your current environment and that you know what i mean like uh that's what I like it, it only goes up it doesn't go down like in terms of searching yeah well i think yeah. it'll only search in the in the current environment which is my global environment right now like when i'm using inter interactively the current environment is the global environment 
So if I look for something without any prefix, it's going to look in my current environment, AKA my global environment. So it's not going to find it. So I have to tell it to look in this other environment. And so would it be right to say that E environment E is a child of the global environment? Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Well, that makes sense then. Yeah. Yeah. What's the function? Does anyone remember? Parent. Uh, I think it's end parent. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Parent. But that should be that sounds right to me. Let's just Uh. Well, I think that kind of uh, are we are we clear on that now <laughs> or uh no. Yeah. So like what was really confusing about all, about a lot of this chapter for me was I felt like I wasn't clear all these words were being introduced and I wasn't clear which ones were like talking about objects and which ones were like special secret names for objects like right like yeah Yeah. What? Well, sorry. Uh, in this example again, the blue arrows. Those is that showing that that environment is a child of the global environment. In this example, we we're just looking at. I'll just share again. Uh, yeah. Yeah. The blue arrow. The arrow is pointing to the parent of the environment that the arrow originated okay. from. Okay. Which is backwards from how my brain wants to read it, but I'll get used to it. I think, yeah, the thing that I think I get tripped up on a lot is like the direction of like finding. Yeah, which is maybe what was happening in this example that we just went through in terms of, because it says, I mean, it even says in the text, the distinction between binding and being bound by is subtle but important. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is true. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like from an English perspective, sure, but like, yeah, okay. How we find G versus how G finds its variables, which I guess is kind of what we just saw because we can't, we couldn't find G by just saying, you know, environment G. Um, we had to yeah. find it through the, yeah, so. Maybe we should add this to the Hadley question list for Friday. Yeah. Isn't he like gonna be talking to some people from Advanced Star Group or something on Friday? There's like a Google Doc somewhere. Anyway. Yeah, I know they're excited. It was next Friday, isn't it? Oh, it's it's next week. I thought so. Oh yeah, yeah here. Uh, he'll give us an hour. Yeah, Friday, September twenty fifth. Cool. All right, well, maybe we should start a list. <laughs> I don't know. All right, oh, well, maybe I'll just keep going and then we can come back and stuff. Um, all right, you can see my screen again, right? Yeah. Yep. All right. All right, so let's move on from functions for the moment. Um, and so, okay, so namespaces um, is about packages as well, uh, but it's um, it's not, kind of based on the order in which they were uh, called. And so that's the key principle of namespaces uh, is that the kind of behavior of the packages should be consistent, um, independent of, of like what you attach first or, or what, um, uh, what you have loaded together. Um, and so it's kind of the logic of how packages find what they need to operate within 
the environment um, and within the other packages that it depends on. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's often like this, this piece, uh, Hadley talks about how it's like abstracted away from the user. Like you don't really interact with this or see this, um, except I feel like it comes into play like when you see things like package conflicts and like uh, masking happening between different functions um, in packages. Uh, um, so you see that stat sometimes, like I feel like the, I use the here package a lot and um, to, to work in project directories and uh, I feel like that happens a lot, maybe with Lubridate or something like that. Anyway, uh, it's kind of annoying, but uh, I feel like that's like the only time where you kind of see, the user sees what's going on, something about evidence of what's happening with this process. Um, but, but yeah, but it's another type of environment. And similarly, there's a kind of a parent-child relationship and um, that influences kind of where it, where it looks first uh, for the objects that it needs. Okay. Okay, and then he kind of combines namespaces and uh, these different types of environments and packages, or not packages, but uh, these different types of environments, or I guess, yeah, packages are in here as well. So all the different types of environments and kind of how they work together. Um, and so I might need some help from some of you in this one too, but what I understand is happening here is that you have this standard deviation function that's being called it's the uh, I guess the the function is being defined over here uh, in this like function environment I guess uh, I don't know if that's right to say but um, and then it kind of depends on uh, like calculating the variance as well um, so it uh, and, then, and this is kind of the namespace uh, steps and so before it looks anywhere in like the global environment um, it will look in the kind of this namespace hierarchy for the different functions that it depends on um, before it kind of goes back up this tree to the global environment and then to these other pieces that are loaded that are parents of, of uh, the global environment, like the other packages that are loaded in the package environment space. Um, does anyone want to add to that? <laughs> I think that's the the key that the the namespace um, maintains dependencies within a package, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the difference between a namespace uh, environment and a, and the package environments. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's my understanding. Cool. Yeah. Uh, one thing that like helped me understand this diagram was like thinking about like how, what would happen if you like called the SD function from as a like interactively like in R and it was like, okay, so you're going to be calling it from the package stats and then you get like thrown into the function. And after that, everything points to the namespace. So like the user like starts at the package facing thing, but once they call a function, like there's no going back. Like you're just kind of like, then you're just like in the namespace and mm -hmm. that's the whole appeal of it. So mm -hmm. like, it's like a one way switch kind of is how I was thinking about it. Mm -hmm. um, and you can kind of like see that by the think like, you know, the arrow thing points into the namespace and then it is going to go back into the function, but like you're not going back the other way, but it took mm -hmm. me like two readings of this and so diagram to understand that. So I don't know. So does this, does that arrow that goes from the blue arrow that goes from like this name, base namespace to the global environment, is that like not actually a meaningful part of the process? Because like if you're using a function that's defined in a package and then it tries to locate it within this namespace and load all the dependencies, then why, it wouldn't, wouldn't make sense to ever go out of that namespace, right? Is that what you're saying? I, I think, oh, I think the other key thing though is like it's mentioned somewhere is like, everything that's in package stats is also in namespace stats plus mm -hmm. maybe more stuff. So like, yeah, like if you are, if you go into the function and you're like doing stuff and it's going to look 
for some value, it might go all the way up to your global environment. Like yeah. that, that might happen. But if you're referring to anything that's the developer has also like defined and is in the namespace, then like you're not getting out of the namespace. Like it's going to look for all the developers shenanigans before yeah. it touches anything that the user has, has like created, like, mm -hmm because of that like arrow in and then directs your that directs you out to the namespace. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Cool. Thanks. Uh, anyone else want to add anything? To this? I'm not quite sure I fully followed there, but I kind of interpreted it as the user, like I need SD and I need SD and VAR are both functions that I need for this function X that I've created. So it's gonna go look for SD and VAR and it says, oh, I see them in, um, I see them in, uh, in the stats namespace. Um, I don't fully understand like the blue arrows moving along, but I think like it finds the VAR um, function in the global environment. So I thought it was grabbing that one and then it was grabbed, but because SD wasn't there, it grabbed SD from stats. I'm really not. Yeah, I think I think if you create so if you create the function X and you have something called VAR in your um, in your global environment, it will grab that version of of the variance function rather than the stats version of the variance function. But because SD wasn't in your global environment, SD came from stats. So I think that the top is kind of, yeah, like the names, um, it's, like, it's all those like, uh, I don't know what we were calling them like. Wait, I think. The environments or parent environments, but, but yeah. Like, when, yeah, like when, when you, uh, are you able to, do you have our studio open? Are you able to? Yeah. Uh, oops, uh, one second. Forgot which way I have to move it. Uh, sorry, I have different uh, the screens. There we go. Oh. Okay. So up in up in the environment pane where it says global environment, if you click that little down arrow, I don't know what those are called. I guess they're like package environments. Yeah, I would say those are pack. So this would be, yeah. So this would be the uh, like all the parents in the order. It looks like it's in the order that they were loaded. Uh, so when I look at that diagram, it's like, to me, it looks through that list of the, I mean, that's what like the diagram looked like. It looked like it was looking through those different package environments um, to say like, yeah, like trying to account for where these functions exist. But then um, because Ver was in the global environment, that's the one that it grabbed rather than the one from stats. So I guess just like going back to the text of the book that like the more times I read it, maybe the better it happens. But it's, I think it maybe also it's, it's kind of saying that the namespace, the role of the namespace is to make sure that when the function SD is looking for the value there, it finds it in a sequence of events or of environments determined by the package developer, but not by the package user. So like the developer setting up the function tells you, the namespace is like, I don't know, maybe the like, the, the air traffic controller being like, because you're using it from this package, we're going, this package says when I'm looking for variables, I look here and then here and then here. Um, this sentence this, I've highlighted now, it makes me even more confused though. Uh, but no, I think this is, okay, so I think maybe this hasn't, maybe it just hasn't been explained like super well in the text, but I'm wondering if, is there a function in both of these? Like, a, there's like a user-defined function there, and then uh, a function <coughs> there in the stats package. Or is it possible that there is an object? Like, uh, I don't want to say that I've never, you know, named a variable there before. <laughs> um, yeah, so or something else that's always a function. So maybe what, and that would be in your global environment likely if you were just you know working through it so maybe what this function is saying is 
Maybe that's not it at all because this is there's also a function. Oh, no, I think. There. Okay, reading. I think you're right though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're saying that that because of the namespace logic, you even if you had a a, bar, a very a function called var in your global environment, it would not be called when you call SD, even though SD depends on a function called var. Because since SD is part of this package and this namespace, it'll search that namespace for var first. Yeah, I think I I don't I think yeah, maybe I don't technically sense. understand what the namespace is doing, but I think I I feel like more philosophically comfortable with the namespace than with many other things in this chapter just because it makes sense to me that you would you would need something organizing where you're getting how you look for objects basically how, yeah where, you know, how, i think i understand the chart now yeah Ooh. so sd depends on ver it's gonna yeah it's gonna look in the namespace for stats if it doesn't find it there it's gonna keep looking in the other package environments if it doesn't find it then then it will go up to the global environment and look for it i think that's what's going on All right but it would be like super weird if if you had a function in a certain package that depended on some other function that wasn't a part of the package <laughs> like like if you had that case though then it would actually find it in the global environment right eventually I don't think DevTools checks is going to is going to come back clean. Oh, right, right. True, <laughs> true, true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, uh, I don't know. I don't I think it would. I think it would. But but yeah, yeah, maybe you wouldn't be able to compile the package or whatever. Uh, okay. Is that what that RCMD check thing he's talking about is? Like do people know about that? It sounds like a thing you'd know about if you on more package development than I, because you know what I'm talking about? I know what you're talking about, our command check. Yeah, all the advice is make sure you run our command check often. Uh, I don't do package development yet, so. Yeah, so it means if this, if a binding isn't defined in the imports environment, the package will look for it in the usual way. It is usually bad because it makes code depend on other loaded packages. So, all right, so it warns, yeah, it sends a warning about that. But apparently, S3 disk method dispatch works like that. So, yeah, wait and see how that works. All right. But depend on other loaded packages. Is R is R C and D check something I'm supposed to type somewhere else? Because I just know to use like from DevTools the check function. But am I supposed to type that somewhere? No, like I, have no idea. I don't know if they're different. I think they're probably. It's not. Been clear to me. Wonder if it's yeah. Look, Dev Tools check. You know, in contrast to. No, I just I think it's probably the same thing. Whoever this is doesn't. Oh, Tadley, I think again doesn't recommend calling it directly. Run, run Dev Tools check. So you're doing the right thing. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Tadley would recommend Dev Tools. Um, All right. I think Do we? Sorry. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that was about our command check. But I was just thinking, like, I think, I think what it, I think what it means with the, like, the reason you run our command check is because you might forget what packages you have loaded, and so your thing's working because you've got everything set up. But then if you send it out to somebody else and they don't have that, then it's just gonna, then it's gonna do its fun environment journey mm -hmm. that we've now learned about. That is really frustrating when you're like doing something and you write some code and you have like a few different panes open, but they're all in the same global environment. And then you like, uh, and then you'd forget that you like generated an object from some other script, mm -hmm. but it's, and then you like run the, the other script again and like, it doesn't have what it needs. Yeah, it's, it's rough. Um, but, all right. So I'll keep going, I guess. Uh, are we good to like, go move it on here? Still good. All right. Okay, and then uh, I think the last execute, uh, special environment is execution environment. So each time a function is called, an execution environment is created. And the parent of the execution environment is the function environment. And uh, this is cleaned up by like the garbage collector after each execution is completed, unless you explicitly return this execution environment with uh, kind of in the result of the function. Um, 
And so this is another diagram I want to talk about. I couldn't get it to fit on the slide, so I can just go to it. Um, wrong one. Oops. Uh, execution. Yeah. Okay. So he has an example function here. H takes an argument X. Um, uh, let's see. And signs two to A and then it adds two. So it just adds two to whatever you input. Um, and so you get three as a result here. And so they just has a diagram kind of going through how this execution environment works. And so you, you input uh, one for, for the argument X uh, here. And then, so I guess temporarily, this is the kind of execution environment here that X is now in. So one is bound to X in this execution environment. And then, um, and then, uh, and I'm guessing, is this the, the global environment where H is defined? I would think so, right? Um, and then, uh, yeah, so this, each function that's defined in the global environment calls um, or runs through the execution of this function. Uh, and the, the, sorry, I'm kind of botching this. Uh, okay, so then you have um, two. So, so again, in this temporary execution environment, you now have um, A is about, has a value of two. Um, and then once it completes, this execution environment disappears and you now, and you have now, uh, Y is now, takes on the value of three in your global environment and you still have this function that's defined in your global environment. Okay. Did I get that right? <laughs> yeah, I think so. All right. I just wanted to like talk, talk through that because it's, uh, I think another one of the diagrams it's a little tricky um once the dotted arrows get involved it's just like a... so does that mean it's like a temporary relationship or something is that why he has it there? i think that's what it what it means because that's x getting because if you isn't that the thing where you you haven't defined a variable x that exists it just exists within the function. Within the, yeah, right. Within the function and the execution environment. I can't handle Zoom. I was just trying to like scroll up. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so like X doesn't exist in the larger environment. Right, uh, right. It only is created, yeah. In this temporary yeah. execution I get that there's like a, there's like an aesthetic here of trying to keep these diagrams like simple and consistent, but I honestly think more labels could maybe help. <laughs> with some yeah. Of Just in totally. Because like, like, is H in the global environment? Like it seems like it is, but I guess it's it probably doesn't matter. It's a parent environment of X of the yeah. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, it's whatever the current environment is. Yeah. 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 Yeah, it'd be helpful if like Hadley would do a little video with like a think aloud here uh, for these, but um, cool. All right, well, I don't feel so bad about that. Uh, does anyone want to talk more about this before we go on? All right, so I'll just go, go on to call stack. So, okay, so call stack, um, my mind is a record of the of the kind of the functions and the processes that were executed and in a particular order. Um, and so, and then each element in the call stack or um, step is a, is a called a frame. And so in this case, um, you have, let's see, so you have three functions here and then um, each kind of function uh, relies on um, uh, like there's kind of nesting going on. So you have G being called within uh, function F, uh, function H being called within G. Um, 
and then it uh, stops. So, um, so you, uh, let's see here. So each, okay. Um, so I, I believe it starts from like the, the inside, right? So that makes sense. The kind of innermost, innermost part of the function and works its way out. And so uh, you have x equals three, x equals two, and um, x equals one. But I don't quite get why that last step is f of x equals one. Oh, because that's what you call here for, I uh, got it, okay. Sorry, that's the argument you supply to function f. Okay, so that's an example of uh, of uh, of a trace trace back with uh, kind of this call stack idea. Um, you can also visualize a call stack using this uh, lobster uh, CST, which I think stands for call stack uh, function, and this is kind of doing the same thing with the same function we just saw, but it's a little bit more uh, readable, um, I guess, because it it, I, it looks like it's starting now from the outside and working its way in. But I don't know, this sequence doesn't make a, as much sense to me as the previous one, because I feel like I would think about it from the inside out in terms of steps. Um, yeah, I don't know what you, what you all think, but it uh, doesn't make a whole lot of sense to me that that assignment would happen first the f like the layer f layer would be first but yeah. right because like f is the outermost right sorry go ahead yeah sorry oh, okay it's just like like i think this makes more sense because the because of the lazy evaluation like i think the stop is what is really evaluated first like first you get the innermost part evaluated then you go out in r mm -hmm. so i think yeah i think this makes more sense but the other is much more easy, easier to read like if i need to read or to debug trace back is more useful no lobster lobster cst is more useful mm -hmm. But in terms of like the how R executes these processes or however you would describe them, like wouldn't wouldn't this lobster CST like isn't that executed first? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. It's, I think the first first value you get is the CST, like the F. It looks for x. It no. Can you please come back to the functions? Yeah. Like how they're defined. Like when you call g, you call g, but there is nothing inside g. You just call h. When you call h, you call stop. Like the first thing that really is evaluated is stop. Like, like the first thing that happens here really is stop, and then the other thing happens. I don't know. It really makes more sense for me. The yeah. The trace back likes like this happened first. This like it was the last thing, the most important thing. It makes more sense to me, but it I think it's hard to read. Like, yeah, I mean, makes sense. I agree with that, but but I think the numbering is the same in each, right? Like the yeah, three yeah. yeah. So it's like numbered is... in the same way. It's just like ordered and structured differently. Um, yeah. Okay. All right, I think it makes more sense, but um, all right, uh, thanks. Uh, does anyone else have anything here? Uh, that was a lot. I think this is actually the last bit I have. Um, does anyone want to dive into, I know it's coming up on an hour here, like anything that I didn't go over, there's a lot here. Um, there's just a few points here about, at the end about like how an environment is a it's a data structure, but it's slightly different than regular kind of traditional data structures. Um, super assignment, uh, different kinds of advanced bindings where they're lazy, lazily bound, uh, 
and actively bound. Um, I find myself thinking, I think I'm going to come back to this chapter in a couple chapters down the line and absorb more of it. Cause it's, it's one of those things where it's like, I can tell it's going to explain a lot of things for like being able to knowing where to look for stuff that I run into in the future is going to explain a lot of things to me. And I, I feel a lot, I feel a lot better after this conversation than I did after reading the chapter. So that's good to hear. Yeah. yeah that was, this is really helpful. Yeah. I, I agree. Yeah. Um, it's like, um, I'm curious if anyone, go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, it was, yeah. Go ahead. I'm curious if anyone can help me understand, uh, like what was going on with trying to get this package that I built, um, approved through CRAM. So, Part of what it's supposed to do is actually load stuff into your global environment, um, but you don't you don't call any assignments. So you just say you, you call the you call the function, and then the function uh, it's like a debugging tool for Shiny. So it kind of will like populate your global environment with the reactive objects that you have. Um, so it does a lot under the hood to kind of rewrite all of the reactive functions into things that are uh, static instead of being dynamic. Um, it's pretty cool. I use it all the time mm -hmm. at work, um, and uh, it's been really helpful to me. Uh, Is that to like help you isolate problems in your Shiny apps? It just kind of like converts your Shiny app into a static R script, so you can cool. like edit your plot and edit your like. But you can also there's like this view UI function where you can like PI, you can like highlight parts of your code and say like view UI, and it'll like actually show you what that UI is going to look like. I don't know. There's a lot of like, oh, that's cool nifty. Stuff okay. There. But the thing about the global environment, it, it kept like failing the CRAN, uh, like the CRAN approval. Cause they're like, you can't be writing to the global environment. So I actually had to do a step to say, mm. Hey, where do you want to write this? Uh, option one is the global environment. Option two is a new environment, um, or like cancel. <laughs> Um, but I wasn't sure if there was like some other way I was supposed to call it because folks seem to say like I could use just parent end or parent frame. I don't know. I just felt like I was getting all these things like on Stack Overflow that I was finding, but I wasn't sure what actually was like the thing that was going to do what I wanted to and also pass CRAN's, um, CRAN's checks. So I don't know if my question makes sense. So um, I just but have a curiosity. You're going to assign it. You're going to say like, you know, DF is read CSV and then DF ends up in your environment. In mine, I say load reactive objects and then it just goes and like puts a bunch of stuff in my environment. So that's kind of where it's different is that there's no assignment happening. Mm. Um, so I was going to ask, do you use the super assignment like operator in that? Or is it some other way of, because uh, the super assignment <laughs> operator will, will put things in the parent environment, right? Uh, yeah, I use, um, yeah, so what I end up doing is I ask the user, so there's like a menu that pop, like, uh, there's a, I'm using the menu, and then it says, where do you want to put this, and you say, if you say the global environment, it, like, captures that, so it also, it takes, like, an environment uh, parameter, um, but if you don't do that, then it asks you with the menu, um, and then at the very end, it kind of, like, rewrites the code under the hood, um, like, it looks at your script, rewrites a bunch of stuff, and then it like goes through like a for loop and assigns them. So I use the assign function. So I say assign this thing that you're trying to make as the static object and then the environment variable is uh, I see. an argument of the assign function. I feel like I'm talking gibberish, but- um, No, 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 it makes sense. That made sense. Um, but I, I was like really lost on how to get around this, uh, this global, like, populating stuff into the global environment. Because I guess it's pretty frown frowned upon, not, yes, pretty frowned upon, which I understand that like, you don't want to be messing up people's environments because this code does have the chance of overwriting your objects. So if you already have an object called DF and then, you know, this function saw DF again, it's going to like try to rewrite it. So I, I do see why it would be a um, questionable <laughs> feature of the, of the package, but. Um, it's sort of like you can't non-consensually add it to the global environment like you, you so it sounds like you had as long as you gave the option it had success yeah no that's that's a, that's interesting i guess i wouldn't i wouldn't it makes sense to me that that would there would be some rules like that in terms of like package distribution especially i'm thinking of like dummies like me 
you know, I'll just go, when I'm in it, when I'm trying to get something done, I'll just go install whatever package, um, just to get something to work for whatever I'm on. And I probably wouldn't be paying that much attention. And I'd be like, yeah, yeah, it's in a global environment. I know what that means. Uh, it's probably more protective for people on the more applied end of the scale. And yeah. Is there, is there any concept of like, of like moving down from the global environment to like, like to make your current environment, this other environment that you've like kind of, where you like copy the global environment, but like, you know, but like make some changes to it and you're like not modifying the global environment. Like it still exists within the global environment, but you're like operating within this new environment. You know what I mean? That's like a child of the global environment. Like, could you do yeah, like that, that's kind of what I was trying to figure out, but I, I couldn't figure out how to do it. Kind of like when you're in a debugger mode or or if you use browser, it'll like take you in to this like I don't know, like the items that are in you know, the environment pane are now like the stuff inside the function. Um, but I, I really couldn't figure figure it out because mm -hmm. I want the user I want the user to be able to call the variables as they are in their script. So if it's like I don't want it to be like you know, E dollar sign and then the names of their variables. I want this be. But I was just thinking of it like, like similar to like, you know, working directory and stuff. Like, like, could you like, like, is there like a similar concept of like working environment, you know, where you can like yeah, that, move that a level a, down? Yeah, I don't know. Be, yeah, if you could say like set E and V, I don't know if that's an option. Um, yeah, like a, like a safety environment of like, this is my, Maybe maybe that's not the right way to be thinking about this, though. I mean, that's kind of what I would prefer because that way it wouldn't. Um, yeah, like I, I don't want to be overwriting anyone's stuff. Um, right, because that's the like environments the don't to... copy on modify either. So. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like I've been fooling around a little bit lately with um, like Anaconda, uh, and in with Anaconda, you can like create a virtual environment and have like your own like you know package versions that might be different from the environment that like you normally work in on your computer um and i think the whole purpose of that is kind of what you're talking about like like where you're you're able to like set up this environment in any way you want with like a certain version of r or python or whatever and like do what you need to do and not have it affect anything else outside of that you know virtual environment but aren't there is aren't there like a whole bunch of things for R that are kind of similar like um shoot it's just on the tip of my tongue oh like like um like all the package package would a package manager be that sort of like pack rat and all of that i don't maybe that's not quite at the same level of like the environment but mm -hmm. the idea of like you 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 need to use uh i know it's a big part of reproducible research and i know i'm not at all up on it uh but the idea that like you should specify you should you could, if, when you're sharing stuff you should like save and share the environment because then if you used you know version 3.2 of something and it's because it had a you know a deprecated function that you really need it it all works when you give it to everybody in a nice nice container mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. yeah maybe we could ask this on the slack like like is there any way to like create a bunch of children of the global environment that you could like switch between, you know, and then operate within that space? Like, I don't know. Or if there's some other functionality that kind of like does that, but yeah, yeah. I'm sure. Cause I'm sure someone has already thought of, or not. Yeah. I'm sure that's been somebody's bugbear for a while and they've like created something for it. Um, Are there like, um, I feel like, like you mentioned debugger, Jake, but like, are there other packages that, because are there other packages that do a similar type of thing that you can look at to see how they're, how they're doing it? Or have you tried that? Because I, I, I couldn't find anything that, that does that. Because like, I'm looking it, at, yeah. like you like debt, so I, I mentioned this, but like me and Jake both work at, at the same place, um, but you demoed this like, I think like the, the first week I started or something. <laughs> so, so I like had no idea what you were talking about, but um, now I do. But like, this is like, 
like the way this is supposed to work is like you run something and it's like kind of it does like put you in a new little world where you're able to do stuff and then you stop it right like it's like it's changing the behavior of like our studio like for longer than just running the command and returning a result right or now uh yeah no it's persistent like you you run this function load reactive objects and then it like it kind of like translates your reactive shiny script and yeah. like runs it and puts it all in your global environment so it's it is supposed to persist um hmm. rather than just be like because if you use like like you put browser inside a function and then when it got there it would like show you the inside of that function but i really want you to have access to all of the all of the objects of your script um mm -hmm. to be able to to tweak stuff and play around with it um yeah i put a link in the chat if anyone's curious about this and if you end up using it i've got hex stickers i can send your way <laughs> um that's cool. the big time right there yeah i'm just looking through the page uh yeah it's pretty interesting. I mean, is there any way of like uh, at least protecting against the overwrite problem of like someone's supplying, you know, names or something that wouldn't result in an overwrite? Like if they had a, you know, a name that conflicted or I don't know, or does that completely defeat the purpose of like, of like the whole changing your environment to debug type of idea? I guess I don't know enough about well, so your package. Like my thought, I, I did think about trying to flag like, oh, you already have this in your environment. Should I overwrite it or not? But um, because the whole purpose of this is to debug, I, I do want it to load whatever your script is trying to load. And I want that object in your environment so that you can actually debug it. Because that was one of the issues a lot of folks were doing is that they were like tweaking stuff locally. And then they're like, it works locally, but when I deploy it, it doesn't work. And it's because they were like doing too much tweaking at the console. Um, so I did, I did want it to actually um, overwrite. I think I, saw, I don't, I don't want to. Workaround is really, is really successful though. Like, because yeah, like having the option between a global or a new environment. I mean, if you, if you don't care or you can even add something about like, you know, we recommend, I recommend you use global environment as long as you're not concerned about overwriting because that's how it's supposed to work. I think that's, that's not not a detriment to the use of this package at all. In my I'm just reading through it, it's like, yeah, that, that makes sense. I'll take it like, I'd probably open this. I'd open this in an instance where I didn't have a bunch of for you know. I'd maybe try to just like keep the debugging separate from other stuff. So, yeah. I, I mean, I could have made it so that it uh, required an empty environment to run or something. That, that yeah. kind of mention, say like you've got stuff in your environment like run this when the environment Wonder, is like, empty. philosophically that's probably something that serious r people have opinions on right like i bet hadley would have an opinion on should you do this kind of thing in the global environment or create um and like other people probably have more of like a gut instinct for why they'd rather do it one way or the other but yeah, as somebody who would be using this at the super other end of the spectrum from those people, to me, that's like totally, totally fine and usable and would make me think about, would actually, the benefit of this is it would actually make me think about it, about like where it's going and what's happening in my global environment. So that's probably good. I should probably think about my environments more. <laughs> <laughs> but does it even make sense to to call something in an empty environment? Like, is it, is that, I, I would think that would be like the, the whole thing that he was talking about, about um, like quantum, whatever, where like, as soon as you observe it, it like changes, like, you know what I mean? Like, like how, it, like, don't you need a, something in like a, some, some kind of environment to like, that's not empty to be able to do anything? I don't know. Or is that, is that a concept that makes sense? I don't know like an R, like, I guess I don't even know what an empty environment really means. 
Yeah. Okay. So was I mistaken? I think like nothing. Empty environment at the end of the world. Like he kind of drew diagram. So like you have your, you know, your current environment, your global environment, your packages and base, and then like all the way at the bottom of it, it's an empty environment. It's yeah. It's the end of the chain. Yeah. That's super. Yeah. That's you know we're getting. I think I just meant uh, bindings in the global environment. Okay. Oh, I see, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, yeah. So, like, not having any objects uh, bound. Un unhidden bindings. Got it. Well, I, this has actually been, this has been super fun. Uh, I'm going to have to take off, but I can make somebody else uh, a host if people want to stay and keep chatting. Cool. Yeah, I probably should run too, uh, but, um, yeah, this is a this is a lot of fun. Thanks for engaging in this, and uh, I don't know. Thanks for presenting, Kevin. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thanks for not crucifying me or anything for not not knowing not knowing not being an expert on this chapter after two reads of it. But uh, no, it was, it was fun to like to talk it through and helped a lot. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Well, uh, Abby, you're presenting next week, right? Right. Am I? I thought you said you would. Or I don't know. Maybe Did I'm, I? I, mean, I, don't I, I No, you know, I think I can actually. Next week's probably as good as it's going to get for the semester. <laughs> In terms yeah, I of, thought you said you would do conditions but not environments or something. I, I, I but don't. I you know what? Wrong. It's fully possible that I said that and my brain just like shorted uh, between okay. the scene and last week. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Um, oh, cool, cool. Cool. conditions right. I can do. Well, yeah. if you didn't say that, sorry, but thank you. No, you know, I was thinking, I was like, I haven't signed up for anything. I probably should. So <laughs> no problems. All right. Awesome. Uh, cool. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, that, and that's the last chapter in the section. Then the next section is functional programming. Cool. cool. Function factories and stuff. So that's cool. All right. Well, all right. I hope you all have a good evening. See you next yeah, you week. you too. See you later. All right. Bye. 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 See ya.